Kia ora. Thank you for that. Ko te metuati mihia tu ki a koutou ki ngā mana whenua, tēnei whenua, tēnā rau koutou katoa i ngā rangotira. Tēnā koutou, ki a koe, te kaikaranga, te timatatanga, tēnā koe te rangatira mō tēnei. Ngā kaimahi kei konei, tēnā rau koutou katoa. I just wanted to thank you in my language, which is in te reo, which is Māori, and to acknowledge the mana whenua, the people of this land and this place, first off. And uh, thank you for the opening, which made me feel right at home, and I could actually feel that heartbeat and that drumbeat. So thank you for that. Um, I didn't recognise myself, Lisa, in that introduction, because <laughs> all I think about myself, which I'm sure is true for all of you who are champions too, is I think of myself as a mother and as a wife and as a grandmother and somebody who basically goes to work every day and I try and do the best I can every day. But I guess, like Mary, who's an absolute visionary, and Mary, I remember we connected instantly when I met you. I thought, wow, this woman, she's got the most simple idea, which is literally really is brilliant. The idea that basically the most the smallest and the most vulnerable members of our families and communities and society have the most to teach us. What a brilliant idea. And all these years later, Mary, even though I can't see you, oh. <laughs> you're still going strong, and that's wonderful. Uh, can I thank Roots of Empathy for bringing me to Canada, to Toronto? I just love being in Canada, and I can say Canadians are always welcome in Aotearoa, New Zealand. So come on down in your winter. It's our summer then. And um, we're going to look at some of the other connections uh, as I go through my presentation, so I better get to it, because I want to try and cover quite a lot. I also want to thank the people I met with today, because I met with the Ministry of Education and Ministry of Aboriginal Affairs, and I was given, I think, a really substantial briefing, and I can see and acknowledge a huge amount of work that's going on uh, particularly in Ontario, and I had the great privilege of busting in and basically meeting your Premier, who seems to me to be someone who's also uh, really inspired to make a change and a difference. So well done, Ontario. I think you're, you're really leading the way in lots of things, and I hope that I can contribute something to what you're doing here. So I'm not fantastic on technology, but we will try our best because I want to begin this conversation with a kind of challenge at this International Speaker Series. And that is the challenge of the idea that empiricism and science and culture can be reconciled. And particularly the culture of indigenous peoples because of our, uh, if you like, status and our uh, particular social situation. We can actually champion an approach where we can understand our historical contributions and knowledge, and we can expand that and see how the role of empathy plays out, not just in the science that supports it, but also in our greater understanding through an embracing of that, cult that cultural knowledge and depth. So we have a whakatauki, which is a traditional saying. It's a Māori proverb. And we say in this whakatauki about standing with our back to the future. And that is that we can, when we look, see our past. Sometimes others can see our past more clearly than we can. But we can't see our future. So we stand with our back to the, to, the back, to the future, seeing our past and experiencing our present. And what that whakatauki is about is about the way in which we take the things of our past and we bring them into our present and we use them to project into our future. Now, this is not about saying holding on to all you know, bad traditions or traditions just for tradition's sake, but really about a central theme of what I want to get across tonight, which is that there are opportunities, amazing opportunities, and really an obligation to learn from this traditional knowledge and traditional practices and to take them into the future. And that ironically, science is starting to catch up with demonstrating how that happens. So, to Māori, our past is and our present are ever linked. Our tūpuna, our ancestors, are actually here with us in a world that's immediate and tangible and that we inhabit. It's the world of a wairua, which is a spirit world where our ancestors also exist. There are intersections between the world, but also 
there's separations. And it's interesting, for example, when we refer to death, we refer to it as the arai, the veil that hangs over the life, so that you can lift the arai and actually peer beyond into the other world. I want to basically take us on a bit of a journey, and I hope it's going to be challenging sometimes, because we need to have challenging conversations about what we're going to do. So let me start on that journey. This picture here is of a heitiki. And a heitiki is a powerful image within Māoridom. Uh, you could see it as a uh, picture. It looks to me like a fetus, I have to say, a heitiki. But the heitiki is really the manifestation of the most potent life force within Māoridom. And it comes from the connection between tapu or the sacred and the noa or the profane and with the child who connects directly with the ancestors and the existing world of the present. So this uh, carved representation has within its stomach something very unusual. You don't usually see heitiki that have this. If you can just see the little green circle in the middle, that's a greenstone or a ponamu, and I'm wearing one here. Greenstone to Māori, it's a nephrite, is one of the most precious things that you can give somebody because it contains, it has the ability to contain all of the modi or the essence of somebody and can be passed down. So if you have a greenstone that's passed down from your grandmother or great-grandparents and ancestors, you carry a little bit of each one of the people who've touched it with you. And if it's given to you by someone you love, you carry a little piece of that person with you at all time. Now the interesting thing here is that if you look, that ponamu is located in the stomach or the puku. And that's because Māori believe that our feelings originate in our puku. And, uh, you know, really, Roots of Empathy is about how we reconcile our feelings and our emotional intelligence and grow that and reconcile that heart and head. But I'm going to come back to that. So this is important. Now, jokingly, we say to each other that Māori are always driven by their puku. In other words, we tend to eat a lot. We socialise a lot. Food is hugely important, as it is in all cultures, as a point of celebration, as a point of demonstrating love. So to say that our feelings are concentrated in our puku is also a link to all of what that represents. So this is really about the way in which Māori as an Indigenous peoples value the development of emotional intelligence. And I argue that programmes like Roots of Empathy have the focus right because you demonstrate that our most powerful lessons can come from our most vulnerable members. However, we also acknowledge the wholesale application of imported models across any country is neither desirable nor effective, but actually has to be built upon the values inherent within those cultures and those societies. But they also have to be evidence-based and consistent with the very best that we know of what science can tell us. And how we work these together is really our challenge and our skill. So, my focus is on Māori tonight, although I do want to make reference to uh, my Indigenous relatives here in Canada and also in Australia. Because one of the things when you start working with an, any Indigenous population is the startling similarities that occur, and I'm hoping that we will pick this up in the panel discussion, both in terms of our recent histories but also our cultural values and practices. And uh, I'll talk a little bit later about synchronicity and how this comes about. So just a little bit, can I just have an indication? How many of you have ever been to New Zealand? Well, that's a fair number. Cool, great. Well, welcome, come back again. <laughs> so you will have come across Māori. Well, one of the interesting things, and I'll go a little bit into the history, but one of the things that happened when we had European colonisation, it was British colonisation uh, in the 1800s, was that there was a reference to Māori being a dying race because, you know, the impact of assimilation and colonisation. Uh, it was thought that we would die out because we would meet with the superior culture of our coloniser. But one of the really interesting things is that, in fact, Māori, those registering Māori descent, as you can see from the census figures, and these are national census figures, which are compulsory for everyone to fill out, is that, in fact, we're increasing. Hello, hello. We're actually growing. 
And uh, like many other Western countries, and I assume this is true for Canada too, we have a, um, a fairly static and slightly de declining uh, birth replacement rates, so the population, uh, internal population fertility rates are declining slightly. Māori have a slightly higher population fertili uh, fertility rate and slightly higher birth rate, so a more youthful population than the general New Zealand population. And uh, Pacific Islander, who are also uh, Polynesian in descent, have an even higher fertility rate. So there is a phenomenon which the demographers refer to as the browning of New Zealand taking place. A lot of people tend to say that uh, with a degree of consternation. We say it with a degree of pride and happiness. Um, the issue, one of the issues though, is to make sure that in fact that Browning population are well prepared to, t to take their place both uh, as leaders of the next generation. And that's the big challenge because of course we're not being well prepared. So Māori are the indigenous population in Aotearoa New Zealand, but we originated from uh, East Polynesia uh, over 1, 1,500 years ago approximately. Um, Rangi Aitea is the place that we refer to, which is currently called Raiaitea. If any of you have been to Tahiti, you will probably recognise that. And uh, we, we used it as a dispersal point to spread north to Hawaii. Now, some of you will know Hawaii. And uh, also east to Rapa Nui, or the East Islands, and then to the west, down to the Cook Islands or Society Islands, and then even further south, down to Aotearoa, New Zealand. So British colonisation, as I said, began in about the 1840s, um, and mainly initially with European sailors and whalers, and they were a bit of a rowdy lot. Um, I won't go into all of the details, but Māori were very keen to sign a treaty with the British Crown, because we thought we were getting a deal of them actually controlling their rowdy lot. And furthermore, we were getting a pretty good market because almost all of the goods, particularly um, you know, horticulture and agriculture, were actually being grown and developed by Māori. So we thought we were all in the business, you see. Um, but, but it didn't turn out that way. So if you come down to New Zealand, find out a little bit more about the treaty. I won't give you a treaty lesson tonight. The Treaty of Waitangi, which we signed in 1840 with the British Crown, Crown uh, which was considered to be the basis of the constitutional shift in New Zealand where we ceded sovereignty to the British Crown. And for Māori, of course, we never ceded sovereignty. We gave them governorship so they could control their rowdy citizens and we thought we would get citizenship in return and maybe we would have a negotiation over what other things we would also share with them. So we've changed over time. In the interview, intervening 170 years or so, We've changed, just like all peoples change. And there is another whakatauki which I will share with you called Ka Puteruha Ka Hauterangatahi. And what that means is that the old net is cast aside and the new net goes fishing, which is really what this is about. Again, it's about recognising that the children and the babies and the youngsters coming through are our hope for the future. And while we don't like the term cast aside, it's a bit cruel, but what we do is we have to make way for the new net so that they can cast out and keep all of us and nurture us. Now I have to admit, these two gorgeous creatures here, Kahu and Miharu, are my grandsons. <laughs> and what I've indicated here is something that I have heard a couple of times. But, um, you know, I've pointed out in the previous slide that far from dying out, in fact, Māori are blossoming, we're increasing as an ethnic group and as a cultural identity. But our identities are very complex. Most Māori have multiple ethnicities. So we have more than one tribal identity. So for example, take myself. I'm from Ngāpuhi, which is the largest tribe in New Zealand, but I also have Ngāti Hine and I have Ngāti Kahu links, which are tribal groups all from the north of the North Island. If you've been to the Bay of Islands in New Zealand, you'll recognise it. So I have a number of tribal linkages, and that's common. Most people have multiple tribal linkages. But guess what? My father was English, so I'm not gonna steal your line on this one, Kat, but my father was English, my mother was Māori, so I'm the embodiment, the living embodiment of the treaty between our peoples. So not only that, 
but I married a man who was from overseas, so our children are that, and I have a daughter-in-law who's Chilean. So within my family, I have Māori, I have English, I have German-Irish, and I have Chilean, Chilean. So we have all of these, and that's in one family. And what I'm recognising is increasingly the diversity within our own families, even Indigenous families. Not just inter and multi-tribalism, but also inter from other uh, cultural groups who are coming and who are part of us. So my strong encouragement to my grandchildren is grow up speaking not just our language, te reo, and obviously English, which is the dominant language of New Zealand, but be proud and speak your language in Spanish so that they can be trilingual at least and hopefully even more lingual. That's something that I hope for every child. So this is a, an important point that we are more complicated and our cultural identity is more than just, if you like, a single identity and how we navigate this is going to be a challenge but I think of it as a wonderful opportunity. It's a wonderful blessing to have multi-tribal identities and to have a multi-ethnic identity. There are high rates in New Zealand of intermarriage, um, but as I pointed out, an increasing number of children and young people identify as Māori. Now, it's interesting to me to know, for example, the work that's going on in terms of trying to identify who is an Indigenous or First Nations uh, uh, Aboriginal child here, Inuit or Métis child. In New Zealand, we have grappled with this idea about cultural identity and ethnic identity for quite a long time. It is self-definition, although you must have at least one ancestor that you can basically link yourself to in order to prove lineage. So a lot of the increase, we think, is due to the more positive view of being prepared to identify yourself as Māori. And you will note that even my grandchildren, well, you, you may not be able to see, but they have the most gorgeous blue and green eyes. Well, you know, some children speak fluent te reo. They stand up, they're fair. Some are as dark as coal. There is a huge diversity, and they are all part of the rich blessing of our family. So we can't just tell by looking at people. We have to understand if you like, how they identify and the significance of the cultural identity to them. And I'm going to come back and talk about that in terms of education in a moment. So self-identification is the basis with a demonstration of a whakapapa or genealogical link. And I've made the point about the increasing diversity, which is hugely important, and also about the youthful nature of Māori population. So in 2006, 24% of those under 18 years of age were identified as Māori. 12% as Pacific Island, 10% of Asian ethnic, and 72% as, Euro as European. So 1% were all others. For those of you who are good at maths, 1% of all the others. Children and young people, interestingly, were more likely than adults to identify themselves with two or more ethnic groups. So they are more capable of adopting this flexible view about their own identity and their cultural identity, which is something that we need to ponder on as well. This is some work that we did looking at 25 years of the census data because nobody had really analysed it in terms of what its implications were for Māori households and families. And when I refer to Fano, Fano means family. So that's so you understand. And there is a difference, of course. Fano, and I'll come back to this later on, is the family grouping, but I'm sure many of you will recognise, including those of you who are from Irish or Scottish or other descent like that, that Fano is not just your immediate family. Fano is actually your aunties, your uncles, your grandparents, and in fact, living in a multi-generational household was the norm. And what we can see is that this is beginning to change again over time. There are changing family structures to our family households. And it's driven, I think, substantially by the socioeconomic situation at the time. What's happening in terms of affordable housing, what's happening in terms of uh, cultural identity, what's happening in terms of people's ability to get employment. These have a huge impact on the way in which families organise and adapt themselves to deal with the situation that they find themselves in. We have um, the regrowth or the increase in growth uh, in 
single um, in households, basically, where couples don't have children. Um, for Māori, that's a really unusual situation. Um, even though it started high then, it's all relative. These are relativities adding up to 100. Uh, so we do have a rise in households where people are choosing not to have, uh, couples are choosing not to have children. And quite often when they're asked about why, it's because they think that they can't afford them. Now I have to say that when I was 18, my family said, oh my goodness, why are you waiting so long to have children? They thought I was an old maid. <laughs> so you can see that the expectation was that you would have babies quite early on. Um, we also are seeing a rise, although you can't tell it very clearly from this graph, it is in the report which, and the analysis which underlines this, that there's an increase in multi-generational households and multi-family households among Māori families. And a big part of the drive for this happening over the last 10 years and 15 years in particular is the, is the, um, the cost of housing and the increase in unemployment rates in New Zealand. So again, there's a really big relationship between the socioeconomic circumstances of families and how they respond to it. So it of course leads to other, other issues including overcrowding. Uh, we're seeing overcrowding and the rise of diseases such as infectious diseases that are coming back again, rheumatic fever comes to mind, respiratory infections and so forth. So all of these linkages uh, come to bear because of changing family structure dealing with uh, what's going on in the wider society. So Māori have a long history of the reassertion of our mana, our authority, and uh, particularly over things Māori, and remember that included all of our waterways, our mountains, our rivers, our trees, our birds, uh, as well as our practices. It includes our ancestral whenua, our lands, our reo, our language, our crack cultural practices and our marae, our meeting houses if you've ever been, as well as our wairua, our spirit. This continues to the present day, even with treaty settlements. There's some opportunity for greater autonomy as a result of treaty settlements, but they're only a tiny portion of what we used to have, and there can only be a contribution to what's needed to deal with often the accumulated disadvantage that has occurred over those many hundreds of years. So the key is in this, and which is why I've ended up in education, because I really genuinely believe that education offers the pathway to make a difference for children and young people. It, makes, it creates an opportunity or unlocks a potential to provide a development of an independent economic base for iwi, for our tribes, and also um, basically provides us with a sense of hope and a vision about the future. And that's true right from those babies, right from the early childhood, primary, secondary, right through to tertiary. There is a strong critique about the nature of those treaty settlements and about how Māori have emulated corporate structures to try and cope with the demands for economic growth within a neoliberal framework, which is the dominant framework, economic framework in New Zealand at the moment and an agrarian economy. Despite our experience of social exclusion, racism and marginalisation, there is a growing Māori presence within the economy. And the settlement process does enable some investment by tribes which actually shifts that, including ownership over fisheries, farming, service industries, including hospitality, health and education. How these disparate strands will come together is a challenge for how we marry our traditional values and don't give those up, even in the light of trying to adapt to new and sometimes quite hostile, different economic um, uh, values. So let me move on. I've planted a few seeds. Traditional Māori parenting. As I said, Māori are in increasingly diverse households. Almost 50% of Māori children are now being raised in sole parent households, almost all of them headed by women. That has massive reper repercussions. Um, many of you who are familiar with um, the literature around our sole parenting, for example, will know what's been called and described as the feminization of poverty. So the way in which this acts is a kind of dual trap where both because women are the heads of households but also because they are indigenous First Nations, uh, they end up 
um, basically being reliant on government assistance to raise children, and there are higher numbers of children growing up in those households. There are, however, a number of models associated with seeing this as a seeing this in a positive way, how we can actually help Fano flourish, and uh, particularly the work, some recent work by uh, Mason Jury and Takani Kingi and a number of other people, uh, called Pua Waitanga. I haven't written it up there, but I can looks at what are the whānau capacities, what are the inherent capacities that actually bring, if you like, the strengths of families, because they do cope. They cope with enormous adversity, and there is incredible resilience, even in the face of all of these changes and a lot of accumulated need. So whānau capacities, what are they? What are the particular skills within that family? What are the particular attributes of that family? Whānau cohesion, how are they able to pull together? Uh, whānau connectedness, you know, are they able to, to be connected together? Do they come together over certain events? And whānau resilience, what have they learned about surviving and what do they pass on to each other? These capacities reflect things like educational achievement, lifestyles, access to technology or other similar. Connectedness can also refer to the utilisation of social institutions, and that includes, of course, schools participation in activities such as sport or recreation, which has been hugely important for Māori, and also in connectedness to community affairs, the ability to engage in other civic activities. And resilience here in the report refers to the futures planning, the evidence of positive change for families over time, and opportunities for transmission of those values and knowledge between generations, the ability to hold on to our heritage, but also to participate in a modern society with strong whānau leadership. So what I hope you're hearing here is that in fact there is, despite adversity, a resilience and an opportunity and a desire to see what it is that we do well and how well we have survived and to recognise that we still want to hold on and to maintain that cultural heritage as a central part of who we are. So traditional Māori parenting, I've referred to hapu, whānau and iwi. Well, not to hapu, but I'll explain it. Hapu, whānau and iwi as the central structures of New Zealand society. So iwi are the larger tribal groupings, which were the traditional, particularly military and political alliances between groups. Hapu are the sub-tribal groupings. Now, they were the reality. They were people, you know, with whom villages, with whom we would interact, and other whānau groupings with whom we would have close relationships and possibly even uh, military loyal uh, loyalties and intermarriage. And whānau, which is a wider extended family, which was the basis of all village life. Our whaia and our matua. Whaia means mother, but interestingly, whaia also refers to auntie, because for Māori, they're indistinguishable. And auntie is also our mother. And I see a few heads nodding because it's familiar, right? And matua refers to our parents, but matua also refers to an elder whom we respect, somebody who's revered, who have we, has a connection to us because, again, they have authority and a relationship with us. Tuakana and taina is an idea I wanted to share with you. A tuakana is an older brother or sibling, and a tainer is a younger brother or sibling, a younger sister. And these are important ideas, particularly in an educational context, because we've used these ideas as an important part of building up some initiatives, particularly around developing equity in the education system at the University of Auckland. And uh, I think there's, an enormous, there's enormously more potential than even we've begun to experiment with. But you may well recognise that tuakana and tēnā not only were aunties and uncles and grandparents expected to and actively part of their children's, children's and grandchildren's lives, but also your siblings were. Now, I grew up as the eldest of six siblings, but I also had six cousins that I grew up with and my grandparents. So I had a combination of 12 in total in two parallel families. And being the eldest, of course, I was the bossiest. But I had an obligation, a responsibility. My responsibility as an older was to care for the younger. So, you know, in very practical ways, I had to actually provide care. I had to think for them in terms of the decisions that would be best for them and also provide day-to-day -day nurturing care. 
And also, uh, the tainer had an obligation. Those were reciprocal responsibilities. So they would be uh, responsible to the tuakana, you know, a degree of respect, but also for learning from the tuakana. So this responsibility, this relationship of an elder and a younger, I really see as a possibility and a growing, a very sympathetic with the roots of empathy idea. You know, the tainer, the baby in our family, and the bringing together of those children. Yesterday I had the privilege of going to Market Lane School, and if there's any children, and uh, Tom, I know you're here from Market Lane School, thank you so much for the honour of going there. And I saw, you know, grade one and two and grade uh, seven and eight children. You know, the way in which they become a circle around that baby. You know, this is about a tuakana relationship in my interpretation. This is about recognising, you know, that we learn from our youngest ones as well as the youngest ones learning and looking up to the older ones. This is an integral relationship and something, again, that I think we can really expand and is very in keeping with what you're doing in Roots of Empathy. So, that image of, um, or the painting, was painted in the early 1800s of a mother with her pepe, her baby carried on her back, which is how we carried our babies, and a kete, which is carrying some kai in the kete, which is food. And I saw heads nodding, and this is this idea about the synchronicity that occurs, the similarities and the sense of community that we have with our indigenous brothers and sisters, including, of course, in Canada. And we especially see Canadians, and I have to say Hawaiians, is probably the most similar to us in many ways. So there are a real sense of simpatico between uh, Aboriginal and First Nations, Indigenous peoples in a number of countries, Canada, the US, Hawaii, Australia, and New Zealand. Um, and I don't profess to speak on your behalf, but I am going to take a few liberties because I want to talk about some of our uh, common heritage and common history, particularly in relation to education. So, historically, Māori had larger collectors than, for example, with Aboriginal, and there are real similarities with the experience of Aboriginals in Australia too, because uh, we were agrarian and we were collective in nature, so much more like um, our uh, Aboriginal cousins and relatives here in Canada. There were also, however, distinctive cultural practices and obviously languages, but a degree of symmetry between us. For example, I see your longhouses, and I think immediately of our marae. They look so familiar. They feel so familiar. Um, also, the way in which perhaps you group yourselves, and this idea about iwi and hapu and whānau, and how this forms the social organisation. I recognise that Australian Aboriginal and First Nations Canadians experienced forced residential schools where they were civilised in preparation for effective assimilation into dominant society. The schools obviously were intended to provide a basis of employment and they assigned productive roles both within Australia and Canada. And often these roles were entirely about manual labour. So specifically, housemaids for women and farm labourers for men. Schools did not have obviously at that time appear to consider an academic or professional possibility for any Indigenous child. Obviously there's a lot of history and a lot of pain because the manner in which children were forcibly taken from their families, the consequences for those children and for their families and communities reflect badly on societies with conflicting objectives creating a source of cheap labour while also providing a basis for their so-called improvement through employment, especially in rural communities. And obviously I want to acknowledge the legacy of residential schools and the forced removal of children that potently continues to affect what happens in Canada and Australia today. Aboriginal and First Nations artists, academics, children's advocates, and many of us remind us, however, of the emotional and psychological brutality of these practices, but also the resilience of our communities to deal with them. The deliberate removal of children from family and culture is intended to disrupt the umbilical cord that links these children to our traditions and our values, and it worked. 
while the intention was tinged, I'm sure, very strongly with the desire to give them a better education and a prospect of work, it also had the intention of removing them from their culture. And I know that there have been efforts at restitution, especially in Canada. And there is also an active artistic community endeavour to acknowledge the impact of these past wrongs and healing of the damage that was done, and most importantly, hopefully, of never repeating the same mistakes again. But it does take time to rebuild relationships, doesn't it? And part of that is actually restoring the goodwill and support, particularly in educational settings, for the development of an indigenous epistemology and pedagogy. And I hope if there's any children in the room, I haven't put you off and put you to sleep with that language. Now in New Zealand, we didn't have residential schools, but we had native schools. And the same intentions and practices were perpetrated there. Māori children were resident away from their families and their communities, and we were prepared for a role as manual labourers, women as domestic helpers, men as farm labourers. Again, there was no choice at all for academically gifted students to go further in either two professional or clerical roles. And it was said in a statement in 1862 from Harry Taylor, who was the native school inspector, I do not advocate for the natives under present circumstances a refined education or a high mental culture. It would be inconsistent if we take account of the position they are likely to hold for many years to come in the social scale, and inappropriate if we remember that they are better calculated by nature to get their living by manual rather than mental labour. To give the poor man his due, he died a long time ago. But of course, these attitudes prevailed for a long time, and they did underpin the school system and the education system for a long, long time, and in New Zealand, probably well into the 1960s. So we must remember to see these comments and the behaviours and the circumstances of the time where in fact labouring was a responsible choice for all working class families. But to be a native child was to be deemed to be incapable of progression beyond manual labour, to which they should only aspire. There are similarities between these three populations, Australia, New Zealand and Canada and obviously significant differences too, including in our culture and traditions and our geography. But in each of these cases, the impact of these schools and the approach and the education system designed to improve the lot of indigenous children was profound and resonates still to today. The origins of education for indigenous children to promote assimilation and social amelioration in the interests of colonial governments gave way to an increasing indigenous influence by the 1950s and it was coupled with the development of an indigenous rights movement from about the 70s on. Also important in reviewing some of the present day responses to indigenous children in these countries is the need to recognize the degree to which we have ongoing assumptions of a paternalistic approach based upon low expectations or narrow opportunities for indigenous children. Improvements in whole systems is required. You need to design it in with indigenous children to have a large part due to the innovations in these communities themselves, rather than just professional advocacy of working for them. There are deeply entrenched attitudes that we still need to continue to challenge. So I want to share another whakatauki with you. E hara taku toa i te toa takitahi, Engari he tōa takutini taku tōa. Now that sounds like a tongue twister, I know. <laughs> Luckily, I'm not going to get you to practice it. It says, my strength does not come from my individuality. My strength comes from one of many. So as I pointed out, you know, we're part of a wider social group. And this idea about the importance of collective identity is hugely valuable to us. I want to make it really clear that I'm up here. I hope that you hear in the way in which I'm presenting this. This is not an assumption of the inherent cultural superiority of either traditional cultures or Western culture or any culture indeed. In fact, if anything, I argue about the inherent value of cultural diversity. And in fact, I see it as essential to healthy human futures. So cultural diversity 
um, is for me like an ecological diversity. And if we lose that cultural diversity, we actually don't understand until too late the value of what it is that we're losing. So for me, there's a real parallel between that sort of ecological approach and ecosystem approach and the idea of cultural diversity. So I hope I've managed to convince you a little bit about that. Okay. Believe it or not, there's a lot more to come, which is all around emotional intelligence and why it matters. But I'm sure that many of you in the audience will be familiar with the scientific literature, which talks about emotional intelligence, and you will understand why Roots of Empathy is such an important program and so important that we are able to implement it uh, in other places around the world as well as here. I've talked a little bit about the indigenous experience of education. Oh, there you go, you can practice it up there. <laughs> the shared histories, the way in which the institutional and policy responses basically resulted in additional harm to indigenous children and the obligation that we each carry to basically change that. The fact that we need to be honest and recognize that some of those attitudes, quite a few of them still persist. Although we're a lot more careful about how we manifest them now. Be wary of framing a problem and making it invisible to other issues. Otherwise you ensure an ongoing marginalization. These are the educational outcomes for New Zealand. I won't go into them, but you can see we've got a long way to go. But we are on an upward trajectory for Māori and Pacifica children, but we haven't caught up with other children. There's a heap of literature around empathy and why it matters. And why you need to basically pay attention to how we can use these cultural ideas and this traditional knowledge within, I believe, the Roots of Empathy program. And I know that's something that Mary, you and your team are actively pursuing. And I just want to share that we have um, some of the terms that we use to describe our words. We don't have a word that specifically means empathy, but we do have words like manaki, which means to be hospitable to and to care for, to manako, which is to have respect for, and aroha, which is to have love for, to feel concerned for, and also to have empathy for. And these terms are all associated with underlying deeply embedded values and they are a manifestation of our empathy for others. So I come back to my final slide, which is about the future. He kākano ahau i ruia mai i rangiātea. Rangiātea is our spiritual home. I am a seed sown in the heavens of rangiātea. The idea is that each of us is precious. Each of us is precious. We are all of us seeds sown by the heavens of our ancestors. We look back on our past and we navigate our footsteps forward, hopefully learning from what our ancestors have given us. We do have to remember that our way of thinking about the world is not inherently shared or understood, and you can't assume that it's the same way of thinking. But our past, our present, and our future are all connected. So we are here together with our ancestors, our present is now, our present is with all of us here in this room, and our future will be the product of what we collectively agree and are able to do together. So please, let's dream together. Let's change the world a child at a time, but also a collective child and a culture at a time. Kia ora koutou. Can I just say that what we normally do is when we give a speech in Māori, we sing. Now, I don't know, are there any children that were in Market Lane School yesterday here? Tom, you better watch out or you'll be called up to sing. <laughs> well, I'm going to do something different right now. I'm going to get you all to stand up and help me sing. So, tough luck. And this is a simple song. Tom, hopefully you'll remember it. It's not the Umarapiti song. This is a song where I sing a phrase and you repeat the phrase exactly the same. And it says that the three most precious things in life are your heartfelt warmth, your care for others, and also your love. Okay? 
e toru ngā mea, e toru ngā mea, ngā me nunui, ngā me nunui, e ki ana, e ki ana, te pai pera, te pai pera, whakāpono, whakāpono, tu mana ko, tu mana ko, ko te me nui, ko te me nui, Ko te aroha. Ah, you're the choir. Fantastic. Remember, aroha means love, compassion, and empathy.